Thank you so much, Kendall, for uh, the uh, nice introduction. Um, that's true. I, I do mention in there that uh, I travel the world uh, to go at various conferences, and, and that was true. That was true in a uh, pre-COVID era. Um, and, and it's funny because that, that this presentation is, is kind of also about that. When I was going at a lot of conferences, I was wondering, what if there was a way, like I meet so many people, what if there was a way to remember people? But also, as I was meeting all those, all those, those people, and and you know, I spent a lot of time in networking and and in the hallways or at booths, and and I've I've met so many great people, so many good conversations. Um, I've also had some not so good conversations. So I figured, you know, is there a way if I could predict if I am gonna have a good conversation with that person or not based on um, some sort of machine learning algorithm, right? Uh, that would make perfect sense. That would also um, probably be very unethical. So before <laughs> before you start coming at me with uh, forks and, uh, and torches, um, take all of this with a grain of salt, please. Uh, <laughs> so, so, but I, I was still kind of curious whether I could build some sort of an application inspired by uh, the Black Mirror series where I could kind of rate the people and, and give them, you know, just to kind of gauge. And anyways, I was just uh, out there and, and wondering if, if it was possible to do that type of thing. And uh, I ended up actually building that. Uh, <laughs> not that I would recommend using it ever, uh, but but I managed to build it. And it was kind of a fun experience. So this is what I want to share with you today. I'm going to talk a little bit about the process and what I, what I built, how I built it, and um, and what it did. So I, I've used a little bit of Node.js, machine learning, Kubernetes, and most, most, uh, most important of all, I've used a lot of unethical uh, face recognition in there. So uh, this is what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to introduce those, those concepts, how I managed to do that. I'm kind of monitoring the Slack channel over there. Um, so if uh, you have any comments, uh, feel free to share them. I'll answer questions at the end either way. But if there's something like, yeah, can't hear me or uh, whatever it is, um, you know, just, just throw them in there. I'll try to uh, follow along. Kind of it one eye. So let's get started with our presentation. But first, let me introduce myself. Hi, my name is Joel. I work as a developer advocate for Red Hat OpenShift. Uh, this is a Kubernetes platform for enterprise. Um, I um, so yeah, uh, I am based in Ottawa, Canada, lovely Canada, um, and I love 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 Twitter. So if you ever want to reach to me, uh, I'm Joel with two underscores. Lord, you should see them on the slides there. Um, that's two underscores. It's not very obvious there, but if you look over there, like you should see it. It's they they use a very good font. Um, I guess it's small font <laughs> for uh, for my Twitter handle there. So you got it. Uh, any questions? Any comment? Feel free to to reach out. Uh, also, tweet with Thunderplanes hashtag Thunderplanes. Uh, let the world know that you're here. That conferences are still going on even in this virtual world. Um, I uh, believe very strongly, very firmly in sharing knowledge and in being out here at conferences and sharing that knowledge and and learning from all those experiences. I think is is the most important thing that you could do as a software developer for, for your career. Um, and it's a great way to keep that knowledge going and so that we can all grow together as a, as a software developer community. So let people know that there are still events on there. Uh, so tweet, um, uh, hashtag Thunderplanes, and let's get started with this presentation. So the first thing I wanted to do was to build an app, right? So I wanted to build an app that would help me to um, start tracking people. So what did I what did I want to do? Like, so I had to figure out how am I going to do that. So the first thing was to find some public data sources. I need a way to fetch or to tap into a, a lot of data so that I could start. Um, rating people basically. So I needed a way to detect faces and then score those peoples. And eventually I needed to deploy all of those things um, inside a Kubernetes cluster. So the public data sources, well, it turns out that there is a lot of data available on the internet. That might be a surprise to you. Uh, there is a lot of data available. And Twitter is an amazing source of data that you can use. Uh, it's a great source of, of public information. Uh, and, and as a bonus, you get stuff like uh, profile pictures. Um, you can get a, a sense of the, the, the sentiments that people are having when they're tweeting about stuff. Uh, you can see who follows who. So you can create graphs of data and so on. And most importantly, well, they have an API that is publicly available for developers. There are some rate limits to it, uh, but generally it's available. I think you 
Um, as a, a rule of thumb, I, I'm doing one request per second, so I never exceed the, the rate limiters. So if you want to use uh, Twitter, if you're using Node.js, NPM install, um, as we all do, uh, that's basically what all JavaScript developers, and I'm not sure what people here are, what, what's your tech stack, favorite tech stack? I saw a few C Sharp in there um, in the Slack channel today. I'm, I'm a big JavaScript fan. That's what I've been using for over 10 years now. And basically as a JavaScript developer, the only thing we do is NPM install, and then we just glue together a bunch of libraries and it, it just magic, magically works. So, so NPM install, uh, Twitter is a library on NPM that you can use. And once you have that, you just generate your Twitter client to pass in your, your API keys, and then you can do stuff like um, accessing the API. So you can get uh, the followers list. So this will return me my list of followers. Unfortunately, those calls are limited to a, a maximum of 200 per request. Um, so I had to do a bunch of requests to get the all, all the list. And, and as it provides you with the first list, it gives you a cursor so that you can use that cursor to fetch the next 200 and so on. That was a little bit tricky to use. Um, but one of the APIs that I've used was follower slash IDs. That one is not limited, but it provides me with a list of all the followers IDs that I, that I have. So now that I had all the follower IDs, I was able to create a stream so I could listen in for any uh, incoming tweet that would match a specific filter. In this case, I said, well, just try for any, um, any, any follow or any follower that have this specific ID or follow any tweets that have this specific user ID. And this would return me or create or trigger an event every time that there's a tweet by one of my followers um, mentioning one of my followers, a retweet by any follower, and so on. So it would provide me with a lot of information on the followers, on my following. So I can then use that stream uh, on each tweet, incoming tweet. Um, you can uh, get the user. And it's funny because the API, uh, the Twitter API is relatively old, and they haven't changed a lot of the things. So now everybody talks about Twitter handles, but originally it was a screen name. So they still have that old syntax, but they're working on a new version of the API. Uh, you also need to check if it's an extended tweet. If you're not, the uh, tweet.txt will return the 140 characters version, um, but you have to check if it's an extended tweet. If it is, then you get the full text. So there's there's a, a few little um, kinks that you need to work around, but generally it's a, a good API that you can use. So in here, in this uh, blank screen, you can see that I'm actually, ah, oh, there it is. So I'm currently, oh, that's funny, because I'm actually going to talk about Jeremy in a few minutes. Um, so uh, it, I'm actually looking for any tweets by my followers. So if you are one of my followers and you want your moment of glory tweet now, like now, oh, there's a, there's a few delays, so you might not be able to see it. <laughs> but um, but here you can see like all the tweets that from, from my followers or mentioning my followers. So I, uh, Jen Looper is one of my followers, so it, it, it's a mention from her, so I can see that. So you can kind of get all of that data, and you see that I can now extract that data. I can also extract all the profile pictures of all those people tweeting. Good. So now I have your face and your tweets. So now what? Well. My goal was really to rate you, right? I, I want to I wanna know if I'm going to have a good conversation with you if I see you somewhere. Um, so I wanted my application to be able to give you a rating. That is very, ugh, very important. <laughs> like I said, take this with a grain of salt. All right. So are you worthy of my time? All right. Um, well, first of all, you would have to be one of my followers because, um, you know, because you would already know me and it would be easier to have a, a nice conversation, I think. Um, also because it's a limitation on the API. Um, <laughs> you, you need a good following yourself. I mean, I, I won't waste time with somebody who, who barely has any followers because yeah. um, you need to follow other people because you need some sort of a range in your opinions. And, and generally, very importantly, you need, um, you need your tweets to be positive. I don't want to spend my time with somebody who's just complaining all the time, right? So, so, uh, so I, I want someone who is generally overly positive. So, so those are my criteria for rating people. Uh, so what will I use now to start building my application? We will use machine learning. I, I love this picture. I don't know. I, I, I love it. All right. So machine learning is what we're going to use. If you're not familiar with machine learning, well, you've probably missed the talk just previous to mine from uh, Militia. Uh, but machine learning is a study of computer algorithms that improve automatically through experience. So basically, it's just um, a, a, a software that you will build that will 
uh, learn how to make decisions by itself. So you don't uh, put in a bunch of ifs, uh, you just let the software decide what it's going to do. There's a lot of different libraries to do so. Um, and, and I've just discovered uh, about an hour ago, brain.js, which uh, apparently seems like an amazing library to do some, um, some machine learning. Uh, my first try was by using TensorFlow. Uh, TensorFlow is um, complex. Uh, I mean, I, <laughs> I have a bachelor in astrophysics. I, I should be able to do some basic maths uh, as they're expecting there, but uh, it, it is really complex. You kind of need a good understanding of, of uh, um, matrices and, and all that stuff, and, and I can't even remember the terms, but you kind of need that. Um, that initial knowledge and and the learning curve was the learning curve was really steep. Turns out that um, training a model is, is not only hard, complex, but it's costly as well. Like if you have like terabytes of data that you want to process, it is gonna well. And and there was a lot of comments to that in Slack just a few seconds ago. Uh, people telling stories about laptops melting. Um, it is <laughs> so that could be a very costly uh, mistake, but uh, you'll probably need to rely on cloud computing, and that costs a lot of money. Uh, but fortunately, there's a cloud providers that will offer you a lot of tooling that is available to you for use. Um, well, obviously, you, you'll need still need to pay, but you can still use a lot of those to at least use some of some some pre-existing data sets. And there are some pre-trained models that are available as well. And you should really look into that before trying to create your own. And that goes back to a, a previous one of the lightning talks by uh, Nathan. You know, don't try to create your stuff or, or don't try to reinvent the wheel. If it's already there, just use it. And that's what I ended up doing. So I've used faceapi.js, which is a library that uses pre-trained pre models to do face detections. So I, I gave it a try, and so let's see if we can actually. Um, I have some in here. Uh, where is it? Uh, let me just open up my code window. Uh, and I've got my samples. OK. So this is uh, a picture, eventually. should be there. Ugh, let's hope my live demos work, or else I'll be really disappointed. All right. My computer is kind of overheating at the moment. Let's try to refresh this. And all right, it's coming slowly but surely. There it is. Oh, you just saw it for a second there. <laughs> OK, so let's try this again. Uh, let's pick a file. I'll pick this one. And come on. So we'll give it a few seconds again. That's actually a good time to take a sip of water. If that doesn't work, that's oh, okay. That's going to be really disappointing. Okay, so now my laptop is working really hard, but it did find a face right there with a ninety percent um, certitude. That was kind of an obvious one. Um, when I saw that, I tried different. Oh, that one was way quicker. Uh, so I tried different poses, and 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 it really can find uh, the faces in in various positions uh, in a window. So it was actually doing a very good job. I'm trying to find, so I tried different backgrounds um, and brought a bunch of different things. So face detection, that worked really, really well. Um, one thing that it also does is face landmarks. So I was able to, uh, with those same pictures, to actually pick up and see different uh, landmarks in my face. Uh, so that can be very useful if you want to do something like a um, one of those Snapchat filters or <laughs> you know, if you want to put, I don't know, um, little uh, hearts in your eyes or things like that. So you can actually use those landmarks to, to process data. But it also uses those landmarks to do the face recognition. So it takes 68 different points in your face. And it measures the distance between all of them and, and takes care of all of that. It kind of flattens the face first. And then you can actually do face recognition by using those landmarks. A fun thing with that library is that they actually also do face expressions. So that one is kind of neutral. Um, so if I go back to the first one that was intentionally very neutral, as you can see, and if I uh, try something else here, let's try this one. Um, that one was, well, I, I'm not sure. Angry and surprised, I guess. I guess that's a good mix. Um, let's try uh, this one. So I don't know, uh, angry. There you go. So, so this one was a little bit angry. All right, so I was able to, but that was kind of a fun little bonus uh, that I started playing around. 
to use Face API, uh, you could use it in Node.js with an import uh, Face API from FaceAPI.js. Just use npm to install that library. You can also use it directly in your browser, which was really great, which is what I'm doing right here. Um, so my slides are running in my browser, and I'm directly running the FaceAPI.js library. To, uh, and, and when I click on that uh, new file, uh, this is what I do here. So I get a, a creative file reader. Um, and then I just load that image into a canvas, and then I'll do the, my face recognition on the canvas. To do that recognition, I will start by loading some models. So those pre-populated, so those pre-trained models will come with uh, faceapi.js. There's a few different models that you can use. I've used SSD Mobile Net V1, which is a little bit slower, but does a way better job. There's also a tiny face model, I think. Um, I can't remember them. There's a lot of them that are available, um, and you can just try them on. Once you have that, I was able to do the detection on my canvas. I just run a face API that detect all faces that would uh, find the the squares to that go around the faces with the face landmarks, with the face descriptors, um, and then I was there's a uh, nice function that you can use to just draw those detections on the canvas. So everything was taken care of uh, pretty much automatically. So then I can draw the detections or the face landmarks and so on. So the library is a little bit tricky to use at first. Um, there's kind of a lot of different steps that you need to do, but once you start using it, it, it gets easier. You can also use it in Node.js. You'll just need to monkey patch. Uh, so there's a function, a monkey patch that you can use and you'll just use Node Canvas. Um, and then you'll uh, be able to use it in Node.js exactly the same way. All right, but what about recognition, right? My goal was to recognize people. So let's take this image right here, um, this one. And you'll see that I've trained it with one image so far. So I've told it this is one image of Joel. And you can see that immediately it can, it can find Joel in a picture. There's also someone else there, my lovely wife. Um, so I can train the model with more pictures of myself just to uh, improve the accuracy. But I can also um, add some pictures of my lovely wife here. And wow, poor laptop. <laughs> it's really hard. It's a good thing because it's kind of cold today. And this will actually warm up our house. Um, and if I take this picture again, it should do the face detection again. And it should be able to do the face recognition for the two of us now. So you should see in a second. Drum roll. There you go. So you got uh, it detected me and my wife here, Natasha. So we're able to detect two faces in a single picture with just a very simple subset of data. So to do the face recognition, the code looks a little bit like this. Uh, so basically, you get all the face descriptions in the uh, in the image, and then you just run the uh, face matcher, or you no, you start by collecting all those face data. And you create a labeled face de detector. So you'll say, well, Joel has the following face descriptors. So those 68 points, essentially. And then you'll create a face, mate, face matcher. And you'll give it um, this uh, set of labeled face detectors. And you'll just ask it to find the best match inside that data set. If you are interested in faceapi.js, they have a nice playground that is available. Uh, you can see right now it's loading the model, uh, but you can, and that's what's really interesting about this here is that um, you should see the detection here. They use the Big Bang Theory um, pictures. And if you use Tiny Face Detector, you should see in a few seconds that um, it detected, it was way faster, but you can see that the accuracy is not as good. In fact, it doesn't even, um, Detect, I have a blank. I can't remember his name. The one with the master's degree. <laughs> All right. So um, so you can do, do different things like that. Um, give it a try. It's actually fun. You can use it with a video and so on. I won't do it uh, because overheating. So, <laughs> so face recognition can do it with one single reference point. And that was great for my application because then I could just take that profile picture and use that as my reference point. Now, assuming uh, and that assumes that you have an actual picture of yourself as your Twitter profile, um, or else it won't work. Obviously, it doesn't. It doesn't work if you wear a mask on your on your profile picture. Um, so that was kind of a, that that was sad for me. I had to learn that because I wasn't able to detect a lot of people wear the mask on their profile picture. Um, but still, you should probably wear a mask nowadays. Anyways, okay. So. <laughs> How cool was that, right? So I can now easily do face recognition. As someone said in Slack, it is disturbingly easy. Uh, but let's do some more machine learning. I wanted to do some more stuff. I wanted to do some sentiment analysis. So and sentiment analysis, sentiment analysis, I'll get it. 
Um, it's basically a way just to see if some sort of a sentence is, or a piece of writing is a good way to, to, uh, to say it, is positive or negative. So it'll basically break down the different words. It'll assign some rating to each one of those words. And then it will divide that by the number of words, which will give you an average for that, um, that piece of writing. There is, once again, a library that you can use on NPM. So NPM installs sentiment. Then you can create a new sentiment analyzer. Just give analyze, the analyze method, pass it a string, and you're good to go. So if I apply that to my Twitter feed once again, and let's see what my followers will say. Clearly, I don't have enough followers because there's a lot of staring at it. Oh, there's OK. So we've got one, uh, which <laughs> unfortunately is neutral. Uh, so you've got this score here, uh, 0. Uh, which I've converted into a hexadecimal value. And oh, there you have it. Um, <laughs> Josh is one of my colleagues. He is, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very red most of the time. Um, <laughs> great guy, though. Um, so yeah, so you can see how I can now <laughs> extract that data. I need to take a screenshot so I can share that with him uh, later on. Um, let's do this. OK. So, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah. So you can see how, <laughs> yeah, fun of life stuff. Um, so you can you can see how we can detect and and evaluate and and do some stuff based on the uh, the rating that we found on those tweets. So what do we have so far? So I now have public data. I have your faces. I have your tweets. Are you sure you still want to follow me? Um, <laughs> you definitely want because you'll get all those nice gifts of myself. Um, so <laughs> yeah, angry tweet. Uh, so connecting everything together. And that, that was actually the, the part that was the most fun. And um, I'm running out of time. Uh, well, it's still 20 minutes. But I, I thought the face recognition part would be the most fun. Uh, it turns out that connecting everything was, was a lot of fun to get everything to work together. So I already had all those little pieces. So I had a little piece here that would do the sentiment analysis, a little piece that would do the uh, the face the face training, and then a little piece that would do the uh, face detection. And well, does that remind you of anything, right? It's a microservice architecture. Basically, I, I already had with all my different samples and just playing around with that, that all of those libraries, I had like a microservice architecture already in place. So I've decided to use Node.js containers to help me with that. Um, and then just to add a little bit of challenge, I had never actually played with messaging queues. Uh, apparently, everybody did. Um, <laughs> I guess it's, it's specifically uh, popular in, uh, in, in the Java world, uh, but I, I never actually used one. Um, I, I typically just use a, um, a simple Express server for my Node.js applications, and it works. Um, but, but I wanted to explore that. I wanted to explore messaging queues. Um, turns out it's, it's really fun to use. Um, very, very useful when you're dealing with those microservices and, and those little containers, especially when you have containers that are a little bit slower than others. Uh, I needed a database, so I've used MongoDB here. And finally, I needed a Kubernetes distribution to orchestrate all of those containers together. And I've used, well, I've used OpenShift because, yeah, because they pay me to do this. So, <laughs> so all right, so microservices, that was, that was really fun. Um, so I, I did all of those little pieces. If you want to learn more about containers, uh, I have a talk called Containerization for Software Developers. Uh, so just try to Google it. There will be a link at the end. Uh, you can't see the URL right here. Um, but I'll share it at the end, um, and you'll have access to that video. But basically, a container is a standard unit of software that packages up code and all of its dependencies so the application runs quickly and reliably from one computing environment to another. So what that means, basically, is that you can imagine your container being one big zip file that will not only contain your source code um, or compiled application if, if you're not doing JavaScript, but it will also contain all the runtimes that are needed to run this application. So basically, you can run that same application everywhere, exactly the same. Um, very, very useful. And it also lets you do stuff like for RabbitMQ. I didn't want to install. I didn't want to go through the whole process of installing RabbitMQ. But I, I was able to just use a container that came pre-installed with RabbitMQ, pre-configured. Everything just worked out of the box. It already had the admin. Um, utilities to it. So I was able to, I had a, a nice web UI that I, I was able to use. So really with one single Docker command, I was able to just start that container and have access to all of that. So that made my life much, much, much easier. So yeah, so it packages up everything, um, all the settings, everything, it works out of the box. 
Uh, it is a disposable unit as well. So once it's completed, it destroys itself along with all the other dependencies, um, which is a very nice feature. So if something happens, if it crashes, if it uh, it doesn't matter, it'll it'll just shut down and restart. Um, and it's great if you have stateless application. If you have stateful applications, then it's a little bit trickier. Uh, if you're using a database, you'll need to find a way to persist that data, or else when your container stops, it will lose all the data that it has. But there are tricks to work around that. So to start a Node.js container, use Docker run. Um, Docker run is the command to start any container. Um, I'll run this one in detached mode. So run it in the background, and then you can mount a volume. So when you're working in, in development mode, you can just mount your current working directory into that container. So really, I mount my current working directory to slash app inside that container. And now, as far as the container is concerned, slash app is part of its own um, file system. And it can access it, and, and it will see all the changes that you do in your code immediately as well, because it's really a mapping directly one to the other. You can mount some port as well. So in this case, I'm saying uh, to Docker, well, any incoming request to port 3000 on my machine will go to the port 3000 inside my container. So it takes care of doing that redirection automatically. And then I tell it to use a node 14 image. So that is kind of a tiny Linux, dist Linux distribution that comes pre-packaged and pre-configured with Node.js, uh, the latest version 14, I think 14, uh, I don't know, I don't, don't remember. Um, <laughs> it uses Node 14. Uh, it also has NPM and all the tooling necessary. And then I said, once the container is started, run the command node slash app, which will actually start my container. So I did those containers for each one of those, or I was able to start those containers. Um, one interesting thing when you're dealing with containers is that you can actually really easily change your base image. So this uh, right here, you can see that I'm using 12, uh, 14 or 12. So containers can be very useful if you need to test out a new version. So if you want to see if you can migrate your code from, um, say, you're still using Node 10 and you want to see if you can easily migrate to Node 14, you can just run it inside a container with Node 10. Everything should work correctly. And then you can just try the exact same test with Node 14, and you will see if there are any errors that are uh, being outputted. So basically, to start a container, no, Docker run is the way to do it. Run it in detached mode, map some ports, map some volumes if needed, and then just give it an image. You can also build your own custom images, which will include not only the Node.js runtimes in this case, but all the source code. So this is what I did. So I built one node container for each one of my tiny microservices. And to do that, I've used a Docker file. So Docker file is just a way to describe that image. So you always start from a base image. So in this case, I'm starting from node 14. I am exposing the port 3000. So I'm telling the Docker that immediately you will have a port 3000 that will be open. Um, and then I will need to do a mapping. I'm changing my working directory to slash app. I copy all of my source code from my local machine into that container. I run npm install, so that will take care of downloading half of the internet and um, just creating that um, that that um, that that node modules folder and adding all of those files. And then my container, my image is ready to go. That last command here is what will be executed when the user uses Docker run with the name of my image. So it will run or it will execute a command node dot, which will start my container. So that is basically how you create a Docker file. Uh, once again, that was a very quick intro or uh, Docker build to build that, um, that container. Um, it should be a D here, Docker build, and then Docker push. So you can push that to a registry, which will um, contain your images. So that was a really, really quick introduction to containers. Um, once again, uh, you'll find more information at the end. Uh, I'll share some, some links there. So the messaging part was um, uh, another interesting thing. So I needed all those containers to be able to talk to each other. And how can I achieve that? Well, this is where I've used the messaging queue. So I've already talked a little bit about that. So messaging queue is a form of asynchronous service-to-service -service communication used in serverless and microservices architectures. Messages are stored in the queue until they are processed and deleted. Each message is processed only once by a single consumer. Message queues can be used to decouple heavyweight processing to buffer or batch work and to smooth spiky workloads. So basically what that means is that you have one publisher publishing messages and you've got one consumer consuming messages. And in the middle, you've got your messaging queue, which will, well, be a queue of messages. That is essentially what it does. Uh, very similar to when you use um, WebSockets or things like that. So basically, you can just send messages back and forth between different 
components in your systems. But the great thing about that messaging queue is that it will actually take one right here. So the consumer will take the uh, first message that came in, process that, and then tell the messaging queue, okay, I've processed that message. You can delete it now and give me the next one. So you really take one message at a time. And what happens if your container crashes halfway because it overload or anything happens? Well, it doesn't matter because the messaging queue hasn't deleted it. So you can just restart that container. It will pick up that last message and process it as it should be. So very, very useful in um, microservices environments. You can also have competing consumers, um, which I think the name is not really good. Like they're more like cooperating in this case. But anyways, so in my case, the, um, the first thing that I did when I got a tweet or whenever I, I noticed that there was a new follower, or whenever I noticed that I have a new follower, I immediately sent a message uh, taking the last profile picture and the last tweet, and I send that, or and I send all of that new tweet information to a, a first microservice that will actually transform that tweet into something that makes sense and that I want to use in my database, and that is very very quick. It's just a small mapping and just transforms that data. And then this service sends back the message to the database. The message database treats that message. Now, saving that message to the database takes a little bit more time than actually processing and transforming that data. So what happens with my messaging queues that I can immediately send my messages quick, 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 but then I can add more consumers for my database so that they'll be able to um, synchro or, or at the same time to add more data into the database so I can clear my queue. Or I can just let them buffer up. Um, it doesn't matter. So, But there's different ways to do it. But you could use multiple consumers to clear that queue a little bit faster. There's also a request reply pattern because my brain is used to work in um, with get requests or rest calls. Um, I was really looking at different ways to do that. Like let's send a request and wait for a response. Turns out that it's, well, it's not really best practices when you're using uh, messaging queues. And it turns out that I actually never needed it really. So I, I found ways to work around it. Uh, instead, I just sent a message upon completion to another service and so on. So instead of waiting for a response, um, I just process the data and send that to the name. So there are ways to work, but it's possible to do that request reply pattern if you need it. So to publish a message, you can use uh, AMQP library. Um, and in this case, I just connect to my MQ server. I then assert that there is a queue, and I just send a message to that queue. So this is how you send messages. To consume those messages, you uh, connect to your uh, MQ server. You check if that queue exists, and then you will create a consume event. And whenever there's an incoming message, you'll actually be able to process it. So at its simplest, that's how it works. Uh, RabbitMQ has a great get started tutorial, so definitely take a look at it. And now we had to deploy all the things. So that leaves me with eight minutes to teach everything you need to know about He <laughs> said, that's not gonna happen. But uh, I'm gonna give you the, the quick basics of Kubernetes. So basically Kubernetes is an orchestrator for, um, for, uh, for all of your containers. If you wanna learn more, I have a talk called Kubernetes Kitchen. I'll be giving it actually Saturday um, at, Granite State Code Camp. So if you're interested in watching it live, I'll be there. Or uh, just Google it. Um, I, there are some recordings somewhere. So Kubernetes is an open source uh, system for automating deployment, scaling, and management of containerized applications. So basically what it does is that it will let you spin up some containers and spin them down if you don't need them. And it will take care of all the networking between them. So uh, it makes it easier to orchestrate all of those containers. It makes it easier to uh, spin them up, spin them down. So if you're expecting a sudden burst of traffic, you can uh, increase the number of containers that you have and the, the networking. So you have three main components that you need to be aware of when you're dealing with Kubernetes. The first one is a pod. So a pod, for all purposes and intents of this talk, you can, in your mind, say that a pod is equal to a container. Um, in theory, you can have multiple containers in a pod, but for now, just imagine that a pod is equivalent to a container. Um, now, the other thing that you'll need to have is a deployment. A deployment describes the system that you want. So it describes what you're expecting in your system right now. So um, this might be a little bit small, but what I'm describing here, and all the Kubernetes objects are described with YAML files, um, and they all are pretty much the same way. So you've got an API version, the kind of object that you're creating, what metadata so that you need. So, so you can add some labels to make it easier to find. And then you have a spec that describes whatever object that you're creating. 
So in this case, I'm describing a deployment. I say at any given time, I want three replicas of the following pod. So this pod will have a single container. It will be my face detection container. It will have something open on port 3000 uh, and so on. And then so you describe all the different components of your system. And uh, Kubernetes will make sure that you always have, uh, in this case, my three pods up and running. Um, all right, so that's just another deployment. I can use base images as well. So this is how I've deployed my RabbitMQ server. Um, but then what you'll need is also a service. So you'll need to expose all of those different pods as a single service. So when you create a deployment, it will create some pods. It will give them a random name. So there's no real way to find them inside your Kubernetes. So that's how you, that's where you will use a service. Your service will be kind of the gateway to those, to those pods. So in this case, I'm telling Kubernetes to create an object um, with EPA version 1, an object of kind service. Let's call it RabbitMQ. And here's the spec. So I'll be looking for uh, my component queue, and then I'll just map the ports um, 5672 inside my container to 5672. So now that I have a service called RabbitMQ, I can now actually access my RabbitMQ by its internal DNS name. So it created an internal DNS entry called RabbitMQ that maps to all of those pods. And it does all the load balancing and a lot of voodoo magic behind the scenes. Uh, but basically, that's one of the big benefits. So it was a lot easier than using localhost or trying to specify a name or hard, hard code something. Uh, so I was able to uh, just use RabbitMQ here. Now I've deployed all the things. This is what it looks like. Um, so I this is um, actually a, a screenshot from OpenShift. So OpenShift has a nice little UI where you can visualize your application. And you can see all of my different services right here. So um, let me just take one quick second to describe what's going on here. Um, and I don't have any new followers in the, in the last 45 minutes. What's going on? So, <laughs> so if there's one, you, you'll see it here and you'll see all the different messages coming in. Um, but right here, what happens is that it actually, it's probably not, um, I know why. There you go. I do have some new followers. Woohoo! Okay, so you can see here that my uh, Twitter service was fetching followers and it received the um, 1,884 followers. And then it sent that data to the database to see if there are any new ones. Uh, oh, we can see that we have Thunderplanes that actually uh, was added. Um, so that was probably user 168 uh, da, 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 da. Send that message to transformer. Transformer request the this uh, transform that the information. Send that to the uh, information. Assign them a score. So it, so uh, Thunderplanes, you are score 38. Um, and then it got the uh, profile picture, process that uh, that profile picture, and so on. If I just go back to uh, here, so this is what happened. My Twitter service looks every five minutes to see if there are any uh, new followers, sends a message to the message queue with the list of followers, and the message queue will send back the message to my server. My server will check with the database to validate if there are any uh, new followers. If there are any, it will send a message to RabbitMQ, which will then send a message to transform to transform that data in something that is digestible back to my server, which will then save it into MongoDB. If I recognize a new tweet, I will send a message back and to my sentiment analyzer, uh, analyzer right here, send that back over. If that changed uh, the score right here, it will send a message to score, which will create a new score for that user. Uh, if, it, if it detects a new uh, profile picture, it will also send a message to our face processor, I think, or detector. I can't remember which one, face processor, which uh, keep tracks of all the data points and then send a message back and send back to the server. And finally, I have a face detector service that I can use to um, try and, and externally try with um, different pictures. So this is kind of all my architecture. <laughs> that was a lot more work than I probably should have done for a conference talk, but it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun to play with all those different components. Uh, like I said, and, and I, it, it, it let me play with different technologies that I was not necessarily um, used to, to use uh, in my day-to-day -day software developer life. Uh, face recognition is not something you do all the time. Uh, using messaging queue as something completely new for me. So it was a lot of fun to explore all of that. So what about that demo, right? I know you're all here. That's that's ultimately what you want to see. Uh, you don't care about everything that I've just said. So let's just go to that demo and, <laughs> and just go right here. So this is my uh, fancy UI to actually detect now. Um, and um, yeah, I don't have any picture of anyone here. So 
let's actually just go and use this picture that I took with uh, at one of the last conferences, the physical conferences that I went. And I took a picture with uh, some of my friends over there. And there was uh, Jeremy Mice, who uh, tweeted earlier. We saw him, uh, Aaron Parecki, and Bailey Hanna. So you can see here, let's just wait for it. We should see the all the system going on. And there you go. So we've got all the faces detected. You can see that's me. Uh, it was detected wrongly as Todd Albert. So, uh, but that's kind of normal because I, I don't follow myself. So it, my system doesn't have any data about me, but apparently I look like Todd. Um, also, unfortunately, it didn't detect Jeremy, uh, but that's because you saw him earlier. And, and if you remember, he didn't have a real profile picture. So it, it kind of thought that it was a uh, uh, with 50%. So maybe I could increase that. Uh, a little bit more. We also found uh, Vincent Mayers here, which, well, that's not Vincent Mayers. <laughs> so, well, clearly it doesn't work as expected, but, but, but here's one. We've got, uh, we've got Bailey. So it actually managed to uh, find Bailey in the picture. So that kind of worked. That was really good. Uh, and it scored Bailey as a 16. Um, so, <laughs> so that's, that's kind of, uh, well, not a very good score. Uh, and, that, and that leads me to my uh, last slide here. And just a quick note about unethical machine learning. And unfortunately, I don't have a lot of time to talk about it. And I should take a lot more time. Uh, Alicia already talked a little bit about that as well. And I think it's important to hammer on that nail. Um, so as you can see, um, some of the people, the scores that, that uh, they got was not really good. And and. And that is because I've, choose, I've chosen some, some ratings and, and some criteria for that rating that don't make any sense. And that's not going to predict anything about the conversation that I'm going to have. I mean, uh, Bailey's a great person. Um, you know, I, I really enjoy spending time with her. Uh, but if I would, you know, only rely on this application, well, clearly I, I would have never talked to her. So um, really be careful. Be careful what you do with machine learning. If you take some wrong data, you're going to end up with some wrong outputs as well. So it's really a case of garbage in, garbage out. Um, there has been a lot of documented cases of, um, of various machine learning algorithms that uh, were biased and they outputted some, some, some results that were biased because the, the, the people that or the data scientists or the programmers that were behind that were actually biased. And, and sometimes it's, it's not because you, you, know, you want intentionally to have a bias, but uh, you have unconscious biases and, and they just go into that algorithm. So you have to be really, really careful when you're using machine learning. Be careful in what you're building. Um, be careful for what uses you're actually using it. Um, you know, use your superpowers as a software developer for good, not for um, rating people like that. That would be a very, very bad application. But please don't do that. So a few links I'll leave you with. I can take your say for software developers. If you want to learn more, uh, you'll have a link at the end. Kubernetes Kitchen, another talk that I gave, uh, which is an introduction to Kubernetes. RabbitNQ, the getting started. The material is great. FaceAPI.js. You can find out more. All of that at easyurl to slash unethical. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you, uh, Thunder Plains, for having me. Uh, it was a blast. It's been a great day of presentations. And I'll stick around for questions, if there are any.